What is the Schomburg Center? To me, it is home. The place where we come to see who we really are, not just somebody else's reflection of who we are. The Schomburg Center is a place of culture, it's a place of history, it's a place of knowledge. The Schomburg Center, to me, is a repository of all of the things that has documented our sense of worth as a people. For me, that means that it is a place of immense power. The Schomburg Center is a public research library and a cultural institution. For the study of the Pan-African world. It is perhaps the best in the world. My Schomburg Center is Arturo Alfonso Schomburg. Arturo Schomburg said, Black history and culture and intellect exists at a time when most people didn't believe that. He collected those evidences, and that became the beginning of the collection. And it has expanded and has grown to where it is now a world-class institution. It holds over 10 million items. There's no parallel anywhere that brings to light what we as people of color have done, what we continue to do. Black culture is all of culture. The universals that animate everyone's life happen here for all people. The Schomburg for me is one of the center pillars of Harlem. When I started the journey of finding out about Red Rooster and Harlem, the very first place I went to was the Schomburg. Researchers from around the world come and use what we have here. I could not have written just about any of the books that I've written without the Schomburg Center's archives, resources. The Schomburg Center is much more than a library. We encourage lifelong learning and exploration. The Junior Scholars Program is a Saturday program with students from fifth grade to senior year in high school to help them learn about black history and culture. Learning about my history is important because it teaches me who I am. The Schomburg Junior Scholars Program is going to do nothing but uplift them. So many talented and brilliant people have walked the corridors of this amazing institution over the years. From Octavia Butler to Toni Morrison and James Baldwin, Ella Fitzgerald, Alvin Ailey, and Harry Belafonte, who graced the stage in this room of the American Negro Theater. This place evokes great memories. It was a gift to us in our community to really try to find that space to reflect expressions of black experience. I just knew that the environment, what I saw these young African Americans doing, was a place I needed to be. What is my Schomburg Center? I'm standing here at the Cosmogram, which underneath holds the ashes of the poet Langston Hughes. On the evening when this cosmogram was dedicated, people began to empty out of the auditorium. A jazz trio struck up, and to my amazement, Amira Baraka went over and asked Maya Angelou for a dance. And they started to dance on top of the cosmogram, on top of the ashes of Langston Hughes, and I felt what a fitting way to kiss the memory of Langston. The Schomburg Center is a research institute and a library, but it's so much more than that. There's something going on every day. So many amazing people come here to talk about their creative craft, to share what inspires them. The Schomburg Center's collections help to tell stories even beyond our walls. The Schomburg Center is here in this exhibition at MoMA, One Way Ticket, Jacob Lawrence's Migration Series. We depend on the resources of the Schomburg to enable us to tell the story. Thinking about the implications of the past on the present is absolutely crucial for understanding the next steps, understanding what we have to do to go forward. We today have the responsibility of making sure that new artists and activists, new scholars and poets know that this place continues to be a resource and a source of inspiration for the work that we must continue to do. The Schomburg Center is knowledge. The Schomburg Center, to me, is education. The Schomburg Center is home. It is family. It is foundational. The Schomburg Center is inspiration. The Schomburg is with me in everything that I do. Community, inside and out. The Schomburg Center is us. The Schomburg Center is you. And we invite each and every one of you to find your Schomburg Center.
Good afternoon. I hope that you've been enjoying yourself today at the fifth annual literary festival here at the Schomburg Center for Research in Black Culture. My name is Joy Bivens and I have the distinct privilege of serving as director of Schomburg Center and um, I'm welcoming you back in as we begin the wrap up or the, uh, to get ready to close the program. And we have a really wonderful guest with us and I'm excited about this conversation. And I'm gonna tell you a little bit about our author, Stacy Spikes. Stacy is an award-winning entrepreneur, co-founder and co-chairman of Movie Pass, founder of the Urban World Film Festival, and a former film marketing executive and producer. Named by USA Today as one of the 21 most influential blacks, excuse me, blacks in technology, Spikes is also the founder and CEO of Pre-Show Interactive, a branded content app that rewards gamers for watching long form video content. In his senior executive roles at Motown Records, Sony Music Entertainment, and Miramax, he worked with some of the biggest names in entertainment, including Boys to Men, Stevie Wonder, Spike Lee, Queen Latifah, and Eddie Murphy, and we're gonna get into all of that in this conversation. Spikes is originally from Houston, Texas, and he now lives in New York City with his wife and daughter. I want you to jo uh, join me in welcoming Stacy to the stage as we talk about Black Founder. That was the most not elegant way of, of getting to the stage, <laughs> tripping over the, the carpet. But I want to welcome you. Thank you, Joy. How are it's you? It's really wonderful to have you here. And before we get into the questions around this book, I want to say happy Father's Day to you. Thank you. And I you. want to wish all the fathers in the audience a happy Father's Day. Let's give it up. missing my dad so oh, um, yeah. just thinking about that and um, however I know that he would want me to get into it <laughs> and I want to uh, talk to you a little bit about this this book black founder the hidden power of being an outsider so this can be purchased in our Schomburg shop and of course um, make sure that you get it read it it's a really entertaining uh, tale of, of your time in the entertainment industry. And I wanna, um, I wanna go back to the beginning. So you're from Houston, Texas. Yeah. And the beginning of the book really starts with your time at a video store. Y'all remember those? <laughs> video store um, where you used to go and you used to get these little boxes and put them in other boxes and watch them on other boxes, right? <laughs> Um, and so you tell the story about working in the video store and really understanding that you wanted to be connected to this industry, yeah. but it wasn't going to happen for you in Houston. Yeah. So can you just talk a little bit about how you kind of thought of, how you thought about plotting that course for yourself in the entertainment industry? I'm, I'm sure I was the only kid who did this, but I had... Ebony, Jet, Right On, Black Beat, mm -hmm. right? And everybody in these magazines lived in Los Angeles. And I remember going to LA and I was very little, I think I was five or six, mm -hmm. and my parents, uh, we went to Disneyland. Mm. So all I knew was the airport, my uncle's house, and Disneyland was Los Angeles. Mm -hmm. So, working in the video store, knowing I wanted to be in the entertainment, in the back of my mind, it was all Disneyland. It was like this. <laughs> it kind of is. It, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> and um, so, I, I, that was the only place I figured to go. That was where, you know, the next stop had to be. But I talk about it in the book, both of my parents went to Grambling. And so they both went to HBCUs and it was, well, you're going to Grambling, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. you know, there wasn't a question of it. And um, so I had, I had just graduated from high school 
and I had three hundred dollars, and I had and to. And you were proud of that too. I had to. Yeah. I, I I had to break the news to my parents that I was going to take a summer off, and I was going to go to Los Angeles, and I was going to strike it rich real fast. Two three <laughs> two three years, I was going to be a big success, and then I was going to come back. But uh, yeah, that that's that's the idea that that kid in high school had. Mm -hmm. And so when you got to LA and you're starting to kind of formulate your ideas about how to get in, there's some things that happen that kind of steer you in a, you know, steer you in a course yeah. that maybe you didn't want to go down or you should not have been going down. And then you, you were able to course correct yeah. Yeah. and uh, really connect with some folks who helped to shape you. Yeah. And one of the things that I think is most uh, kind of interesting about this book is really the mentorship, the, the people you met along the way who really um, kind of, they, they didn't just help you, they really informed the way you think of the business and not just that particular business, but just oh. business practice in general. Yeah. And I wonder if you could introduce folks who haven't yet read the book to some of the people who really helped to shape your, your journey. Yeah, so uh, I was very fortunate. I got an opportunity. So a little back history. Barry Gordy had sold Motown to Universal. And Universal back then, the Japanese had, had, were coming in and trying to buy up all of Hollywood. And they had just sold it. And Gordy did an amazing deal. He sold the brand and the artist going forward, but he maintained Joe Bet Publishing, all the royalties and all the, the, the back catalog. And you know, he was just one of the smartest deals there was. So that entity had moved to Los Angeles and they were starting to staff up. And I went on an interview, I got the job, I was a gopher. Let me keep your expectations really low. Um, it was like, right there on the spot, like, great, you're hired. You want to get coffee? Sure, you're mm -hmm, hired. Mm -hmm. And my job was to take the album comps, albums, these vinyl things. That <laughs> you, so you had to take the album comp to each department, get it signed off, and they had a little sign, you know, people's initials, and, and they had to give their comments. And my literal job was just keep these things moving. And... There was this gentleman, Oscar Fields, and Oscar was like the first one who, you know, you're out in the world and it, it's, it's more than parenting, it's more than mentoring. They know you're away from home, but they're, they have a sense of responsibility to groom you and teach you. Mm -hmm. And Oscar was the first one who taught me about writing personal notes, mm -hmm. thanking people for things, uh, getting your own stationery. Um, uh, how to use fountain pens mm -hmm. instead of big ballpoints, um, and that they could tell the difference of how you wrote. Um, he talked about going to dinner and how I how we ate. Um, I tell a, a bit in the book about Oscar was the first one who taught me you work on the small fork and knife on the outside and you work your way in. Uh, when there was a three-course meal, like I had no idea what that was about. Um, but beyond that, they taught you about business and Oscar said, you know, you have to walk in a black world and a white world. You have to never forget where you've come from, but you also have to excel in their world and you have to be able to do both because he would tell you, you also can't forget who you are and where you come from because you need to remember who you represent. And there's a lot of people who died and made sacrifices for you to be sitting in this opportunity. Um, and he, thank you. And he, you know, when you come out of high school, you don't have that depth of thought. You, you're like, you, you're so surface level. <laughs> you're, your impulses are about what can, how can I stay happy in the next hour, right? You are, you are not thinking that far back. Um, and so he was one of the first ones reminding me 
that his generation were the first to go to college, mm -hmm. you know, and I'm now the first behind them. And so there were, there were people in his position that he wasn't the CEO and that, okay, you, you, you need to go be the CEOs now. Mm -hmm. we, we couldn't quite get there. Mm -hmm. um, and it was also growing up in a time where you didn't realize the impact of shows like, and this is why media and entertainment is so important to me. First you see it in fantasy and then it becomes reality. Um, growing up with the Jeffersons, mm -hmm. Good Times, um, Sanford and Son, um, there were these shows that they didn't exist. They, before that, there was just, it just didn't happen. We were walk-on roles, you know, and for the first time we were owning businesses and the Jeffersons, you know, owning their own cleaners and living in a high rise and blah, blah, blah. So anyway, it was, that's the stuff that those mentors started to teach me and I was fortunate enough, I think also being at one of the most powerful black entertainment, probably black owned companies in the world at that time. Mm -hmm. That brand stood for something and the people who worked there understood what it stood for. Absolutely, and the, you talk about the, the deal that Barry Gordy was able to strike to, to maintain the masters of the artist, but also to shape what the, what the employees, what the staff looked like at Motown, right? So you walk into a world yeah. that is primarily run by African Americans. Yeah. So you go from there, and what's the next step? So I, I went from there to Sony, and it was really the beginning of seeing what a, an amazing place. Uh, you know, I think, it, I think it's close I didn't go to a black college, but I think it's the closest to, in the business world, you were in a black university and you were living in a culture where it's like, we, we can run everything. We can do financial spreadsheets. We can run everything from top to bottom and responsibly and profitably. Mm -hmm. um, so then I, 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 so while I was there, I started there when I was 20. By the time I was 21, I was, a, so let me explain what a product manager is. So, and this is something I fell into, I didn't go to school for, but a product manager is a person who, uh, the artist development is the one who helps record the album, and the product manager is the one who helps do all of the marketing and promotion. So, what does the cover look like? What does the artwork look like? What song are they gonna release? Like all that stuff is the marketing side. And so I was a product manager and, um, our, our, uh, you know, there's other names for it, but that's what they called us. By the time I was 21 in a year and a half, I had, I represented Boyz II Men, Stevie Wonder, Spike Lee, Eddie Murphy, and Queen Latifah. And it was just right place, right time. And what had happened was Boyz II Men was this doo-wop group that you got to remember back in the day, you had NWA and you had these, you know, very hard rap and very hard rock. You had, you know, Nine Inch Nails and Guns N' Roses and uh, Nirvana on one side, and you had NWA and Ice T and Cop Killer on the other side. Where's Boys to Men going to fit in all of this? You know, and I was, we were the same age, so I was their age. And I'm all of to, I'm sorry, I'm trying to wrap my head around being that young and being in this position to really influence culture yeah. in that way. Yeah. But go ahead, yeah. tell your story. And so they were kind of like, well, he's their age. Because the other product managers were older and they prided themselves on, well, I'm Diana Ross's product manager. You know, it was, mm -hmm. they, they didn't want to start on this new thing, these babies. And so they were like, Give him that. <laughs> and next thing you know, Motown Philly drops and boom, you know, and it's a good in, time. end yeah. of the road. And, and I'm like, yeah. <laughs> and my parents are still like, what do you do? For <laughs> um, and, and as that took off, when someone 
Motown started to become hot again, and it was a place where, because even the R&B music was still rough. It was still rough. And so these artists that started to come over, they wanted something a bit more prestigious and a bit more highbrow. And so Queen Latifah, we won a Grammy for her Queen Reigns album. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I remember being on the back of that artwork is her brother's, uh, her brother's uh, plate where he's buried. I was standing right there where the photographer was up on a ladder shooting her on that. So everybody who was coming onto the label kept saying, I want boys to men's product manager. Oh. And so by default, you know, what are you gonna do, argue with the artist? And so they're like, okay. Mm -hmm. And the next thing you know, I'm 21 and I've got all of these. So it was like, Mandela got out, Stevie Wonder did, a commemorative album and we made a commemorative song. He made a song for Mandela mm -hmm. and we created a coin and an album and gave it to Mandela. And Spike Lee, we did Do the Right Thing and Jungle Fever soundtrack. Um, Both amazing soundtracks. Like, hot, you, it's just right place, right time. The whole, all of this, I was just right place, right time. And, um, <laughs> And that was, that was the beginning. And so it, all of a sudden, I'm this product manager. I was in Hollywood Reporters, 30 under 30. And the phone rings and Sony's like, hey, we want to talk to you. And they fly me out. Mm -hmm. And um, I didn't want to tell them that. So they had increase in salary, great. Got some great artists coming. And then they said, and by the way, you get 40% off of all Sony equipment. I didn't want to say that perk got me. <laughs> it was like, big screen TVs half off? Where do I, that's what I mean by, it. That, that was the extent 20, of my thinking, right? Yes. You mean I get a half <laughs> off of a TV. And, but it was Oscar and Clarence Avon mm -hmm. and these others that Gerald Busby said to me, he was the CEO of Motown, and Gerald, at a, at a dinner party, he leans over to me and he says, don't stay anywhere more than four years unless you own it or you have equity in it. Why would he, why would he even utter that? Like, th we weren't having a conversation. He just looks at me and says this. That was the beginning of the thought that mm -hmm. ownership must mean something. And what I realized is you can be making half a million dollars a year, but if your contract comes up and they don't renew it, because the higher you go, the longer it takes to find another job. And they say it's one year per hundred thousand dollars on average, the higher you go. So you have to think about that. Mm -hmm. And so yeah, that, those people may get paid a lot, but if they don't have equity, something that's increasing in value without them needing to do work, uh, and that's cut out from underneath you, you're just paycheck to paycheck. There are gems like that in this book, you know, like things that I, we were talking back um, in the back there, that in many ways this reads like a manual, particularly if you are starting out your career and you are thinking about, you know, how do you navigate, how do you negotiate, make moves, all of those kinds of things, whether you're in this industry or not. And I, so you move from LA yeah. to New York to work for Sony. How does Oscar take it? Ooh, he did not like it. Um, you know what? I, I, I was young and um, I was afraid that if I told Oscar I had this offer and I was considering this job, that he would have talked me out of it. Mm -hmm. And I kind of wanted to go and I believed I, you know, I, I wanted to go, I was believing all the press and the hype and I wanted to go do big things. And um, so I didn't talk to him about it. I accepted the offer and just kind of came in and told him. And he was, so, he was literally heartbroken to think that he would not have my best interest at heart, that I assumed 
he would not be able to think that way, hurt him. Mm. And he didn't talk to me for about two years. And I would write him notes. I would tell him how things were going and I would try and check in. But it was very hard to, for a while, lose that connection. Mm -hmm. and, and I learned how to do it a little bit differently um, because sometimes bosses can be, you know, they can just be thinking about their own interests and your, your talent they've groomed that's going to go to competition. Um, but I learned sometimes you're going to have to trust those people who love you for reasons more than just you work for me. And Oscar had that love for me, and I think I was too young to, to realize it. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So you go to Sony, and what, what is your experience like at Sony? So Sony was a very, I went from a very small, powerful company that had a lot of gravitas, tiny little company, to, uh, you know, it, it's not there anymore, but at the time it was at 55th and Madison. And Sony had the whole building, <laughs> all 50 floors of it. And so it was, it was like the accounting department was bigger than all of Motown. It was, mm -hmm. so it was very different going into mega culture and seeing how the sausage is made when it came to uh, the music industry. It had a, it had a distance, um, a cold distance um, to be at Motown and here's Spike Lee sitting in that chair joking and here's Stevie Wonder <laughs> sitting in that chair and, and you know, the manager of Boy Cement, like, like you could just hang out and that, you, you felt like you were at somebody's house. Uh, Sony wasn't, it wasn't like that. And so it was another, it was another world. It was a colder world. It was a, to just put in perspective, that's the label where Michael Jackson was, okay? So it was... But he used to be at Motown now. Right. <laughs> and so in the same trajectory, I remember seeing the crate that little Michael used to stand on because he was too short to get to the microphone in, mm -hmm. in Los Angeles that Motown recorded a lot of the Jackson 5 albums on. But this was now a different world. Mm -hmm. And... Um, in the book I talk about it, I got to meet Michael Jackson when I was at Sony. Can I tell you guys what happened? Oh, tell us, tell us, tell us. <clears throat> I'm gonna stand up and do it. So there was this courtyard. Um, so when you would, the, the building where, you work, where we worked, and then there's this courtyard and the cafeteria is across the way in the parking garage is over here. And so one day I'm, I'm coming out in the courtyard to walk across and, and I look up, and there's Michael Jackson walking with his A&R rep, and Michael's walking like this. And he's, he's, he's like, he's and just he's not. Tall. He's yeah, a tall yeah, guy. Yeah. yeah. Uh -huh. But he's, he's kind of, you know, walking with his hands behind his back and, and the A&R rep, and they're talking. And the guy stops, and he introduces us, and... I say, you, you know, out of habit, I say, Michael, it's such a pleasure to meet you. And he doesn't remove his hands from behind his back. He goes, nice to meet you, too. You know? <laughs> <laughs> and, and, um, and so I, I did what you, you would do. And I say, you know, thank you so much for what your impact in the world and what you've done. And he goes, thank you. And that, that, that's my Michael Jackson. <laughs> um, <clears throat> but... I talk about it in the book, you know, at the time, he was the biggest artist in the world on the planet, mm -hmm. right? There was Elvis, and then now Michael was doing stuff that just, not only did you have this consolidation, do you know, Elvis never toured outside of the U.S., right? Never left the U.S., mm -hmm. and Michael Jackson was the first full global star. He could go to Japan, he could go anywhere and sell out everything, 50,000 seat stadiums. And so that was the most powerful man in music. And I, I think his catalog, when he did his catalog deal was like $2 billion. Um, but 
I was now in that house. Mm -hmm. And it was a different world than how it moved. It had sharper elbows. It just moved in a different way. Um, and so I was learning my chops at, at Sony. But you talk about the kind of the cadre of young people that were at Sony yeah. that you were working with yeah. and, and how, how smart they were and yeah. how engaged they were in culture and that this was at a time when hip hop particularly had taken a turn yeah. for, yeah. for violent, yeah. to a violent turn and yeah. one of the conversations was to try to get an allocation for Kevlar vests, vests for uh, reps to wear when they were with certain artists yeah. because it had gotten that dangerous. Yeah, all of a sudden it become very surreal. So the Biggie Tupac stuff, you know, it, it, we would always talk about it. The, the rock bands, because we're all in the same building, right? We may, hip hop was on, hip hop and black music was on these two floors and the rock division was on this floor. The rock bands, you'd always hear this band and that band were at a club and they got into a fist fight and somebody hit somebody over the head with a bottle. And the rap stuff, it was, you know, it was this one's in the hospital, that one died, this was so and so shot so and so. And I remember we were sitting, this is when I, I knew I needed to make a transition in my career. <laughs> We were having a conversation because Kevlar bulletproof vests are th thousands of dollars back then. And the product managers, they had had a situation. Now, I think Pac had been shot once, but neither of them were dead. They were still alive at this point. And um, there was a shooting at Hot 97. And, um, and we were literally having a conversation about can we expense vest if we if you're required and what got me was we're young black executives who don't have any equity in this company asking white executives is it okay if we can expense kevlar vest so we can make you more money mm. And that, that hit me at one point mm -hmm. because when we, we, one of the product managers had escalated and felt we as executives need to talk about this. But what was deeper was there was all of us young black execs, they were all white finance execs and we're trying to get approval. And I, and I was sitting there and I thought about what Gerald said, and ownership, mm -hmm. and I thought, we want a $2,000 vest. Like, they're not going to give us some special life insurance. Yeah. So we're groveling over a $2,000 vest. And guess what? If those artists go and kill each other, the album sales are going to go up. And if we die in the crossfire, there's always somebody that was, things would happen. You wouldn't hear about that person's name but the sales are gonna go up. They're gonna, you know, they're gonna benefit and we don't have any ownership in that. Mm -hmm. So you didn't stay at Sony very long? No, nah, I had to move on. You had to move on. <laughs> I already wanted, I, I, I already, the wheels were turning and I talk a lot in the book about ownership and what Gerald and those other, you know, just even growing up in a place where that Barry Gordy had created the power of ownership. Um, I was getting itchy already. You were itchy. Yeah. And it's almost, and I was, we were talking again about this. It's almost like the first part of the book is really about this, the formulation of the ideas that you need to own. Yeah. You need to be in control of, of your destiny and of your career. And then the latter half of the book or the latter part of the book is really about implementation. So you move on from Sony and you go to Miramax and I mean, that sounded yeah. pretty bad. Um, Harry, Harvey Firestein. Do I need yeah. to say more? Um, Weinstein. Steve Weinstein. Yeah, so, yeah, yeah, sorry, yeah. my bad. Yeah. Thinking about yeah. somebody else. Um, I was there for about a year. Charge it to the game. Yeah. 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 It's crazy. Yeah. And therefore, and in a very toxic work environment, and then you move on to another. Yeah. Area. So it was, I have to say, though, you, you don't know how bad makes good, right? 
-hmm. all things are to the good. Mm -hmm. That environment definitively made me self-employed, right? It was like that place, I, I was like, I'm never working for anybody else. I ever. heard that. And so being in that environment uh, helped to make that 100%, like I'm not coming back. And um, one of the other things, a little bit of serendipity, so Queen Latifah had moved and started becoming an, a pretty formidable actress. Did anybody see her do Set It Off? Did anybody see Set It Off? That. So like she had done Set It Off and now she was looking at doing some more, moving into like critical work and starting. And so Latifah was looking at uh, doing a deal with Miramax to make an urban film division. And so I was tasked with doing the research and figuring out and I started to realize the black and brown buying power of Hollywood was extraordinarily mm -hmm. big. Mm -hmm. And so disproportionately big. Like mm -hmm. we've, we're, we're double, you know, double our fighting weight when it comes to the buying power at the box office. And so we were doing all these, this research to determine should this company happen. And um, because I represented Latifah, there was a, a comfort and I was pulled into a lot of big meetings and now the deal didn't happen, but all in my mind was like, black and brown people are very important to Hollywood. Mm -hmm. And we don't own a studio, we don't own a movie theater, we don't own a movie theater. Like, so there's so much money and yet, when you go back and you look at AMC and Regal, and these theaters are, are largely family-owned businesses. Most of them are still, to this day, someone is in the family. And if you go back in time, this is why we have to talk about some of the history of film. We were talking about doing some stuff we're gonna do together at some point. Anyway, when you go back in time, up in New York and in Chicago and in some of the northern states, there would be a film that would have a section in it with a black music section. And when that film went to the South, they used to edit that whole section out. And because the theater managers wouldn't even play it because they didn't want black people in it. Mm -hmm. And then you, over time, you know, but the people who make the decision about what plays on what screens for how long there is no person of color in that decision-making process even today, right now. And that's, that's where when you don't own, you can't help make decisions. But when you own, and I think, to be truthful, I think Concy and one other person in Brooklyn, like there's literally two or three theaters that are black home, but like there's no circuits that people of color own at all. Hmm. So you're, you, you've gone through the ranks, you know, you've, you've made your, uh, the one thing I will say is it, is it is so clear how important contacts are and how important networks are because everything you did, somebody said, yeah. you, you know, pointed you in that direction or it was a, it was a network. Yeah. Um, so you're doing that and you, and you finally get to this space where you want to, you've, uh, now you have a, uh, you're connecting with, is it Vibe? Is it yeah. Vibe, Ma Vibe, yeah, Vibe. Magaz yeah, Vibe Magazine? Yeah. yeah. And, and you're making now the music to film connection yeah. between, so your two worlds are ultimately coming together. Yeah. And that's where this film festival grows out of. So can you talk a little bit about that? Yeah, so I was, I was the highest ranking person of color in distribution so at Miramax, and um, what that means is similar to my marketing, I'm an invisible person you don't see, but everything I do is from the, the trailer that you see, the movie poster that's in there, the interviews, where they're going, all that's coming out of my budget. So you're kind of like orchestrating all of that. And, um, and like I said, with the Queen Latifah thing, we started to realize there's a really big demographic here. And so I had, I had appeared in Black Enterprise 
and either Ebony or Jet, there was a feature on me as a black executive. Because I, I remember I had made it because my grandmother black called Black Enterprise, you said. Yes. yes. Mm -hmm. my, my grandmother had called me and said, baby, I saw, you know, you go in a black home and it was like Black Enterprise, <laughs> Ebony, and Jet, right? Mm -hmm. On the coffee table. And she's like, baby, you made it. You were in <laughs> I was in the inside, later I would be on the cover. And, um, and so my grandmother had called, and oh, we're so proud of what you're doing. And I remember going to the Sundance Film Festival, and there had been, I had been there a few times, there had been probably more but one black film featured mm -hmm. with the black cast. And so I went and I met with the Jeff Gilmore, who was the, um, who was head of the film festival at the time. And this is the largest independent film festival in the world. And I said, Jeff, why don't you have more black and brown stuff? And Jeff put his feet up on his desk and he said, you know, we get 3,000 submissions a year and if it's good, we show it. Mm. And I said, good according to whom? Mm -hmm. And he said, we have some of the best programmers in the world, blah, 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 blah. And I didn't need to look at these programmers to know what in us programming is. Mm -hmm. And I left his office with the biggest resentment. Mm -hmm. And I, I, at the time, Vibe Magazine was this really big rising empire. You, they bought Rolling Stone. Uh, they had the TV show, the magazine. Uh, big conglomerate that Quincy Jones and some other investors are doing. And Keith uh, Klingscales was the CEO. Mm -hmm. And I called Keith up and I was in his office pacing back and forth telling him about this Sundance meeting. And I was just pissed. And he said, um, we should make a black can film festival. I said, yes. <laughs> and um, that was the idea of Urban World. How many of you have heard of Urban World Film Festival? Yeah. So that was, that was 1996. And by 1997, we launched Urban World. Uh, it, it premiered more number one in top five films in any North American festival. It premiered Hostella Got Her Groove Back, Water Fools Fall In Love, Original Kings of Comedy. Uh, collateral with Tom Cruise. We had Tom Cruise do the premiere here mm -hmm. in Harlem at Magic Johnson. Like, we got Tom to come up to Harlem. <laughs> and, um, <laughs> and so this will be its 27th year. And um, awesome. And so when, you know, Ava DuVernay was our publicist and became a filmmaker out of the festival, uh, Tim Story, uh, Malcolm D. Lee, uh, Rosaria Dawson, like all of that talent came out of Urban World. Mm. And so we really took this thing that everybody kind of joked and laughed at at the beginning and showed its power. Um, and so all of that, Jamie Foxx, all of them, they were kids. Think, think, of, think of all of these people 27 years ago, they were kids. Rosaria used to walk around with tape on her glasses and she was nobody. And, um, and they were at the panels and doing everything. And so rolling that forward, now you have these people working and changing Hollywood. Absolutely. You know, Stacy, we have an audience that I want to engage with questions. Yeah. But if y'all don't ask questions, <laughs> I got plenty to go around. So uh, there are two mics at the back if you'd like to start queuing. Um, for the questions. I, I have one that I'm going to just selfishly ask before we get into uh, into the audience questions, because um, we haven't even gotten to movie pass. Yeah. Uh, we haven't gotten there yet. Yeah. Um, and that is um, for a young person reading this book and all of the things that you've been um, involved in and all of the different parts of your work, is that something you saw yourself doing? Is that uh, something you developed an appetite for? You know, as you were uh, as you were moving through the ranks, working with trying to raise capital, uh, making pitches, all of the things that are part of the work that you have to do. Is that an, 
was that natural to you or was that something you developed over, over a course of, of time? You know, I think it's part of, I guess, my generation. I grew up in the age of hip hop where there were no rules and you saw people owning and doing and making and making power moves. Uh, you know, I'm of that generation with Rockefeller, mm -hmm. you know, um, Beyonce and I went to the same school in Houston, so the same middle school. I was there before her, but uh, it's the same middle school. Um, and so people you see now sitting up in certain positions, we were all coming up in the game together. And I think watching TV shows that showed black people owning and doing things and moving up and then seeing the Barry Gordys of the world and Diana Ross and the Supremes and people making moves, I think we didn't know you couldn't do it. Mm -hmm. Nobody told us, well, that's not how you do it. Because we, you, you also looked at white culture, and I think in generations before, you know, my grandmother, one, my, my father's mother cleaned people's houses for the, her whole life. My mother's mother sewed curtains for Sears. And when Sears started to go under, she did it out of her home. And they never went to high school. They never, right? That generation couldn't do anything. And then there was the next generation that started to do things. And you saw um, black publishing, black labels, uh, restaurants, hair care companies. Like you started to see a layer of things. And then we were their children, right? So we were like, mm -hmm. of course we can do this. Mm -hmm. So I think some of it was nobody said you couldn't. You just was that, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. that's what you did, mm -hmm. you know? Mm -hmm. Do we have any? We don't th I don't think we have any questions, so I want to. Oh, oh, yes, yeah. I have a yeah. question um, yeah. in the back. Yes, sir. How you doing? Uh, my name is Tim. My question is, uh, would you say that Tyler Perry is an example of what Busby and you guys spoke about back then? And if so, uh, what do you think of his journey and his accomplishments? I, I think 100%. Uh, Tyler Perry is a byproduct of a different way of thinking. And I think everybody always thought that way. Uh, Richard Pryor at one point owned his own production company. Uh, uh, Bill Cosby, sorry, but he did. Bill Cosby owned his own production companies back then, and Sidney Poitier. Um, but they could, they could only go so far, and I think when you see Tyler controlling production and creating the studio, uh, you saw Oprah with Harpo. You know, we were talking about Color Purple. Um, so you see it more and more happening. For me, I want to see one of the big five studios headed by a person of color. I want to see one of the big four exhibitors run by a person of color on a global scale who's making decisions about what's in theaters and how long it plays. Like, you want to see us sitting at the table of decision making. But yeah, I think Tyler Perry is a perfect example of that. So we have a question over here. Yes, sir. Hey, Matt Williams. And <clears throat> my question is about the differences you see in how businesses were started when you were developing your organization versus what the opportunities are now for young entrepreneurs or people who really want to start to found something. That's a great one. I have a very, very dark, pessimistic, bell ringing point that I bring up, and I'm gonna try and say this as succinctly as possible. Back in the day, you could be black and get money, and they would not try and put a restaurant in your neighborhood, or the cleaners, or hair care products. All they would do is say, okay, you go figure it out, you know that world. Today, what we saw, I watched black publishing really die when Twitter and Facebook and other things that are apps now can go into the hood where before there was this barrier 
that we were able to have ownership. I remember uh, there was One World Publishing, there was, um, there, were, there was Black Planet, there were these websites back in the day that were black owned and they were kind of mimicking. And then all of a sudden when Facebook came, it changed because inside of there, oh, well, you can make your own little black world in here. And nobody needed us to get into the black community anymore, mm -hmm. right? They didn't need a gatekeeper because we were our own gatekeepers. And what's happening is the ownership in digital, the, the digital and AI worlds is going so fast, they're laying down brand new railroads when Elon Musk is gonna think about Henry Ford. Think about the fact if Henry Ford not only owned the car, but he owned the gas station pumps too. And he put the satellites in the sky that allow that thing to communicate. Like that kind of leaps are happening right now. And, and I talk about it in the book. I say every parent who has a minority child, please let them cut their teeth on being an entrepreneur. Tell them to make apps in their bedrooms. Learn how to do that because the good thing is you can also create things without as big a barrier to entries, but there's a really big technological land grab. I'm seeing it happen and I don't think the bell is ringing that you're gonna see us fall into a service class uh, I, I, I am in technology and I've already seen the robots that are going to deliver our food, the apps that are going to, everything from, you can see how the footprint, McDonald's and others are testing McDonald's that there isn't a human being in there. You drive up through the drive through and it fully delivers everything and doesn't need a person. So all of that stuff is coming. And I'm afraid we're in that disposable class unless you create ownership. So that's probably the number one reason why I wrote the book. Wow. We have a question over here. Yes, sir. Yes, you touched a lot upon a lot of things today. I'm just like, oh, so much stuff, so much information. But as a minority in your field, um, oftentimes being the only black person in the room, how do you navigate those spaces? What are the challenges? And do you find yourself having to um, code switch to get certain things done or to reach a certain level um, in those spaces? That great question. Yes, um, in short. Uh, there's a story in the book where I was being interviewed a few months ago by a writer at um, The New Yorker. Mm -hmm. And she was a white woman and she was interviewing me. And we were talking about being a founder. And I said to her, if we walk out on the street and we stop 100 people and say, close your eyes and describe a tech founder, I told her, they're not going to pick me and they're not going to pick you. And talk about code switching, I think, it's, I think we're in technology where the sports industries were back in the 50s before integration started. And I think that as they see more of us, they'll get used to the idea. But right now, you need to go to Stanford, Harvard, Yale, Princeton, and you need to look like Mark Zuckerberg. And you need to drop out, and you need to be writing code. That's, that's the, the way it's identified. But when you see founders of color over and more and more, then money will follow success. And so my feeling is in the same way, you know, Hank Aaron and Jackie Robinson and Willie Mays and uh, Walter Payton and people had to walk on the field and they had to win. And, but they had to, what we don't see is they had to be called every name from in their own locker room to their own side of the field, even their own players, they had to be called every name in the book and they still had to win. 
And then it starts changing because like, well, damn, they, they're good. <laughs> then it's that you're good, right? But, but now in technology, only one to 3% of minorities and women get funding. And so that's on, on the entire, you know, basketball league, that's less than 10 players, right? Not even that, that's like two to three players when you count all of the players on the league. So yes, they're switching, but, but you know what? I like Billie Jean King's book title, um, Pressure is Privilege, where she talks about that. And the pressure of being the first is from the privilege of being here because of all of the people who made sacrifices for me to be able to have the opportunity to go be early. And hopefully with this book and some of you that are gonna follow, I'll, I'll hold the door open and you guys run in, right? And it's like, that's what I'm, I'm here to do. I'm 55 and you know another 10 years, I'm gonna have to turn it over and say, you guys gotta take it from here. And I'm Oscar Fields for this right, generation. Right. So I wrote it down so you guys can change it. Thank you. Do, do we have another question over here? We have time for one more question. Okay. Uh, uh, this is going to be two questions. Fire away. Let's go. Oh, um, the two easy questions. Um, I remember every world back in the days was definitely popping. So the first question is simple one. Were you guys, were you there before the guys in Miami? The guys that do the thing in Miami? Yeah. And I knew at one point you did a distribution thing where you made movies. Yeah. How'd that do? What was the problems? Cool. Um, so the Miami, so there's ABFF, is that what you're thinking? Or are you talking about how can I be down the ABFF. conference? Yep. So ABFF is, uh, a, we're the same age. We were both uh, film festivals that are born around the same time. Uh, and Jeff Friday runs that one. Jeff's a good friend. Jeff's in my cell phone. We talk all the time. And um, we're colleagues in the struggle. And when, when we got Urban World Film Festival up and we were having some good traction, we decided to move into distribution. And we acquired about 17 films. We were starting to put them in theaters. And September 11th happened. Mm -hmm. And after kind of like the pandemic, when you emerge from these big financial hits that a country takes, investors only want to talk about things that are cash flow positive or that already are making money and we weren't there yet and the movie industry is a very thin margin business like publishing and other things um, so we weren't able to keep funding it and then being you know minorities you're going to be the last one to get the crumbs that fall on the floor at the table at back then we couldn't get access to capital to keep it going so we ended up shutting it down yeah thank you Thank you for those questions. Um, we are coming to the end, and I, 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 I didn't even get to talk to you about MoviePass, and, but what I will say is that if you are interested in becoming an entrepreneur, or if you aren't, even if you're not, this is a really great book to give you great guidelines, practices, kind of guiding principles for how to shape your own career. Um, and it is a real gift to, so this conference is, or this festival is all about literacy as generational wealth. And where we put our stories is how we pass down our wealth. And you pass down a good deal of information that'll hopefully make some of us very wealthy in the future. <laughs> um, I wanna thank you for being here. You, I wanna thank all of you all for attending the festival today. I want to, uh, invite you to come back to the Schomburg anytime. We are here uh, for your research needs. We have exhibition, we have public programs. If you're not a member, become a member. If you are uh, concerned about libraries, uh, engage your, your local legislative officials, no cuts to public libraries. We need places like this to have these conversations. <laughs> And I just want to have you um, say to you, have a joyous Juneteenth. And rest, eat, do all the things, all of it. And um, enjoy yourselves and celebrate the emancipation of our people.
And to all the dads, the uncles, the brothers, the grandfathers, have a happy Father's Day. Be safe. Take care. Thank you, Joy.